Welcome everybody, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord and I want to welcome you to part two of Heart Cubed where the purpose of this three-part series is to ensure that we have healthy Christian lives and that our spiritual heart monitor is never flatlined. It's good to see each and every one of you. I, uh, for most of you, you know that I arrived back home last week and it's great to be home. I see some of you that were gone on the holiday weekend and welcome home. It's good to be home. It's good to be amongst the people that you love and that you desire to give your life to. And thank you. I, I'll just one more thank you. I've thanked so many people, but thank you for the privilege of taking some time to pull back and rest and for God to uh, just give me uh, a renewed sense of what um, his purposes are in our lives and in my life and my family. And uh, I pray that over the weeks and months that you will say, wow, it was good for pastor to go away. And uh, because the Lord spoke to him and we need God to speak to our pastor, don't we? Amen. Amen. And uh, God wants to speak to you as well. You know, just like we take physical checkups, we also need to take spiritual checkups. And this series is about having a spiritual checkup because uh, we need it. We need to once in a while evaluate and make sure that, that where we are is anchored in the things that truly matter in our lives and our Christian walk. Because if you're like me, sometimes life can start happening and you, if you're not careful, that anchor wants to get pulled up. But how many know we need to keep ourselves anchored in Jesus, anchored in what life is really all about? Anybody ever been tempted to have your anchor get pulled out? Amen. But how many are glad that we have an anchor uh, that is, can be in Jesus and the foundations of what he's about for our lives? And last week we shared that, a healthy, that healthy Christians have a heart for God. And Jesus said to love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And we dug into that. And I don't have time to go back. I encourage you to listen to that message. And Today we move into the second part of Heart Cubed and we talk about uh, a heart for others. So last week was a heart for God, today is a heart for others. You know, I've got this message so burning on my heart, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a new revelation, but I believe that God is going to re renew this revelation into our hearts and in our church family in such a profound way that it is going to change us as a church from this day forward, that God is going to speak something so profoundly to our hearts and renew something that he's already put into us that, that it is going to literally change what God does in the days and weeks ahead. Would you be all right if God just showed up and did something so wonderful in you that, that it brought such focus and clarity and spiritual health to your life that, uh, that, that all of a sudden, all the things that we have to deal with sometimes will just be so less than what he is doing and what he is saying to our lives. I don't know about you, but once in a while, and when you're in the muck and the mar of all the things going on, you just need that word from God. You need something in your spirit that just says, yeah, this is what it's all about, and, and nothing is going to thwart what God is saying and what he's doing. I'm ready to preach this. God help me to get this. It, it's in me. I just pray it'll get out. Um, one of the sad consequences of living in our fast-paced society is that there's potential for losing the ability to develop meaningful and lasting relationships with others. Tim, I'm going to have you pull me back a little because I feel like I'm probably going to be shouting a little bit, and I don't want to kill people. I want to love them to life. Amen? And uh, can you hear me on the back row all right? All right, good. I got a couple people waving at me. We live on superficial levels too often in life. Because of that, we may not respect that some of our relationships, some of our relationships can and should be lifelong if we know how to proceed through difficult times and difficult challenges with other folks, with people in our lives. Just yesterday, someone serving on our Servolution Day said to me, it's so nice that you and Kathy have had such longevity as our pastor. 
And I explained that the reason this is possible is because there have been enough people who have loved us and allowed us to be their pastor even if and when they didn't agree with every decision. That's pretty awesome if you think about it. You know, the average length of pastors is pretty short. Pastors move around from church to church to church, and, and, and you all have put up with me for quite a while. And, and really, it's because I believe that we've allowed each other to grow. We've allowed each other to make mistakes. We, we've allowed each other to have the kind of relationship where we can talk, where we can work things out, where I can apologize, where you can apologize, where we can be humble, and we can understand that the work of God and the calling of God in our lives to work together is more important and so many other things that the enemy would like to do. Do you realize how much the devil hates what this house is about? How much the enemy hates it when we serve the Lord and we love God and we love others? The devil hates that stuff. And so, do you realize that I do not know or necessarily agree with everything that goes on at Calvary? Did you, did you ever think about that? I don't know everything that goes on around here. Shock, shock. Can I say this? This, might, this is off page, off script here. Sometimes I'm glad I don't know everything that's going on around here. I'm glad that I can just go after God, let him put a word in my spirit, and come here free to deliver it, and let God, by his spirit, land it where it needs to be landed. Somebody told me last week, Pastor, everybody else could have went away. That one was for me today. I didn't know it. But the Lord knows how to custom make things for us if we're, if we're sensitive. I don't know uh, everything going on around here. And, and by the way, I don't always agree with everything that goes on around here. But I'm committed. I've got a few things on my heart that I'm concerned about right now. It might deal with you. It might deal with me. I haven't arrived. I've got some real growth needed in my life. Don't ask Kathy, but she could tell you. <laughs> How many of you have got a few things that probably need a little working on yet? You, 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 Aren't you glad somebody loves you even when you act out a little bit? But I'm learning. Praise God, I can say this with, a, with honesty, that I'm learning to first give things to the Lord and then wait on his timing to bring adjustment that may be needed. Or for God to show me where I could be wrong as well. When we deal with others, it's difficult sometimes. And for a church like ours with the vision we have to love people to a, to a life in Jesus, it takes people who know how to work through difficult things. If we had a church body like all of you and we had critical spirits and we were looking for problems, Oh, what a mess. My dad pastored a church in Florida growing up, and, and a, a gal showed up one time, and, and she told my dad, literally, she honestly, she said, Pastor, I want to come to your church. God has given me a fault-finding ministry. <laughs> my dad said, Sister, I think there's a better church somewhere else for you. No, he said, you know what? If you're looking for faults, you'll find them. How I many know if you're looking for problems, you'll find them? I heard the story one time of a guy stranded on a desert island. Some of you I've probably told this before, but it just, I just got to share it right here. He was stranded on this desert island, been stranded there for years, and finally a ship is passing by, and he can see that ship, and he builds a fire and smoke signaled the ship, and they noticed him. 
And the captain gladly offered to take him off the island and said, go get the others and we can all leave together. Go get everybody else on the island. Let's get you off of here. And the maroon guy said, you don't understand. The island is deserted except for me. I've been the only guy on this island for years. And you saw me. The captain inquired, well, what are those three huts over there then for? And the, the guy replied, well, the first hut is my house that I built to live in. And the second hut is the church I built to be able to worship my God and to have a church to go to. And the captain said, well, what's that other hut? He said, that's the church I used to go to. That story says a whole lot if you ask me. I, I just, it ministers to me. As wonderful, caring, and serving as we may be, we've still got learning to do when it comes to truly loving others at all times. Our God told us to reach out to everyone with the love of Jesus. A God kind, listen, a God kind of love is the evidence that we are authentic followers of Jesus. People respond to genuine love. When your spirit is right, when my spirit is right, and people know that we're truly concerned about them more than whatever ministry that we might lead, more than whatever cause we've got going on, more than whatever task that we need to implement, more than whatever is right and wrong technically, when people know that we care about them more than any ministry or leadership position that we have. I've learned when you care about people and they know you care about them, most of the time they'll be there even when you mess up. And you will, and they will. So the first point, the most important part of this message before we can reach out to this world as a church body and reach the Quad Cities for Jesus, the first thing we have to do is our love must reach in. The Bible says that the people in this world will, will know that we are Christians by our love for each other. Wow. The Bible has so much to say on this topic. John was one of the three closest friends of Jesus. There was Peter, James, and John. And when John wrote the verses that we're going to share as the Holy Spirit wrote through him, John, by this time, had advanced in his age. And he was the only remaining original apostle who had personal upfront contact with Jesus while on the earth. And though he's now older, John is ministering and overseeing many churches and refers himself now as an elder. And he writes to strengthen the faith of his readers. And I got to tell you, when I read these verses, I realize it not only was to strengthen those readers that he was writing to in that day, it ever bit as much applies to us here today. And so we read in 1 John 3.11, as this last original apostle of Jesus that walked with Jesus was his closest friend on this earth. And John says, this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Since the message of the good news of Jesus began, love has been the central theme of Christianity. Love and care for one another is not an optional duty for true Christians. But the Bible tells us in John 15, 12, and 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23 that, that our love for one another is proof that we've been born again. It's one of the two things that Jesus says covers all the law and the prophets, meaning the, all of the Old Testament. Jesus says, this covers the whole thing. And they said, what is it? He said, two things, covers it all. 
Love God. Love each other. Folks, do you realize no matter how, quote, deep of a word of revelation we get or how awesome we, we are able to split Greek infinitives and understand the great Hebrew backdrop and dig into this and that and have this incredible, awesome word, that if we don't love God and love others, we miss the whole thing. We may not like everything everybody does. Just this week, you didn't like something. Somebody did. If you're really honest, you didn't like something you did. But if, if we belong to Jesus, we're to love him. That means that they're to literally feel and know that we love him. You ever wanted to set somebody straight? Thank you for your honesty over here. <laughs> Everyone else was thinking it. Do you know if we set somebody straight and there's not a spirit of Christ-like love extended towards them? Nothing good happened. It's hard to preach this message because I'm, I mess up once in a while. This is one of the things the Lord has so renewed in my time of refreshing to bring me back to what this is really all about. I get caught in the weeds once in a while and forget who I am. Forget what life is all about. Forget that the high road once in a while is not a bad place to take. I forget that everything don't have to be fixed today. You all right? Three verses later we read in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. We know we've passed from death to life because we love our brothers. John is repeating the same truth and expanding on it so we might gain more clarity on the importance of loving our Christian brothers and sisters. And then just four verses down, he says in 1 John 3, 18, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Amen. Now John says, we're going to open this up a little bit and go a little further. We're going to go a little deeper. It's a love that causes us to go out of our way and actually do something. It's not just, I love you, I love you, I love you. See you later. It's a love that does something. And it's also a love that is honest and not patronizing. But it's encouraging. It's not negative. It's not beating people down. But it's honest. It takes the Christ-like spirit to kind of put that all together. We have to check ourselves. And when our spirit's not right, you know the better thing to do when our spirit's not right towards our spouse, towards our children, towards the people in this congregation, towards those that we work with. Do you know, the, towards Christian folks, do you know when our spirit's not right? Even if we're technically right, we can be all wrong if our spirit's not right. And it would be better to hush our mouth, go hide somewhere with Jesus for a moment and get our spiritual checkup, be reminded of what this is all about. Because if you're in a leadership position or you're in a serving position with others and your spirit is not right and your eyes are, are not right and your countenance is not right, boy, I'm preaching to myself because you all know my eyes. If it ain't right, you can hurt folks. Yeah. 
If you're sitting there thinking, Pastor, some folks need hurt. God help you to listen up here. <laughs> the other day, I was upset at somebody for the way they weren't loving people. And I just about let them have it. And the Lord said, wait, you're about to let them have it and not loving them through them not loving others and you're going to be just as guilty. Hush. I'm like, shoot. Jesus said in John 13, 34, and 35, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The church I grew up in in Florida was started by my dad on the Gulf Coast. It was there I first learned of ministry as dad started the church and I went into fifth grade. And Dad was there for 10 years as I went from fifth grade through high school and two years of college studying music. Dad pastored there. In that time of life, we, Dad and our student ministries director taught us the Word of God by teaching us little tunes. And, and we only learned it in the King James Version. I'm sorry about that, but that's how I learned the Bible in King James. So most of my memory verses from being young are all King James, these and thou's and all of that. One of those went like this. Uh, it was from 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Dad uh, had us to learn scriptures with tunes so we could be easier to remember scripture. And, and one of them that you all, some of you know is, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. And knoweth God, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. So, beloved, let us love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8. That's how we learn the Bible. Healthy, loving relationships must be built with the, in the local church. This is the proving grounds for us as Christians. You know, our proving grounds to go out and win the world for Jesus is we prove our love by how we love one another. My, my, um, my father-in-law, Kathy's dad, David, was a mechanical engineer in his career, and he worked for... Komatsu Dressler in Peoria, Illinois for many years, and one of his jobs was to prove that parts work on the field. And he would have to set up these big jobs where they were testing these monster trucks that had payloads of like, I don't know, two or 400,000 pounds in these big off-road coal mines around the world, and these trucks he got me on one once and it was just massive this truck I mean huge that I'm six foot five and a half I was six six but I'm six five and a half now and I only came halfway up the tire this is a big truck and I remember the proving grounds he'd take me and show me that sometimes they'd set up a test for maybe a, several weeks where all they did was take this monster engine with the fan blades that helped cool the, the I don't know what I'm talking about, the radiator and fan blades and all this, and, and they'd rev that engine all the way up, and they had it set up to a computer and rev it all the way up and back down and up and down for days, trying to make sure that that fan blade would hold up in the field when it was really being put to the test. Would it hold up or would it cut, fly off and kill somebody? Now, I may not have that all just right, but the principle is they wanted to prove that it worked. So when they got out there on the field, it worked. It did what it was supposed to do. 
And I thought about that little story this week as it related to this message, and I'm thinking, wow, the Lord wants us to, to prove our love for each other that it really works. Because if it doesn't work and then we go try to take it to the world and, and it's not proven, then we mess up God's plan for our lives. Sometimes we think, well, it'd be easier to love people you didn't know so well. But the Lord wants us to learn how to love people we know pretty well. If the church were our idea, we'd have, we'd have probably made it full of people who were just like us who thought like us, agreed with us in everything, and didn't irritate us in any way. I mean, if the church were our idea, we, we would probably have, you know, we'd help God decide who got to be a part of the house. But like our own family, the church family is not like that, is it? Just as we did not choose our earthly family, we do not choose our spiritual family either. We're called to learn to love our earthly and spiritual families. In fact, Jesus said that our love would be the evidence that we're truly following him. Jesus is our supreme example of true love. 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Now let's look at Jesus' statement again in John 13, 34. I want to show you something. Maybe you never caught this. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is a great nugget from God's word. We are no longer to love others like we love ourselves. But we're to love others not like we want to be loved, we're to love others, not the way they love us. We're to love others as Jesus loved us. Jesus says, this is a new command. I'm taking this up a notch. I want you to love one another like I loved you. In the old commandment, we're told to love our neighbor is ourselves. In the new commandment, we're to love one another as Jesus demonstrated his love to us. The question then becomes, how did Jesus love us? To answer that, we have to look at his life. Jesus loved us when we did not deserve his love. Jesus loved us when we were not too lovable. He loved us sacrificially. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus loved us enough to lay down his life for us, and what makes this love even more incredible is that he did it while we were still in our sin, Romans 5, 8. So how do we give this kind of love to others? How, how do we love people this way? How can we do that? Well, we're told to love with actions, which are good deeds. We're told to love in truth, which is a right attitude, 1 John 3, 18. We need to think right thoughts about one another. We put this on the screen for you. We need to think right thoughts about one another, speak right words about one another, and do right deeds for one another. So first, we can show our love for one another by how we think about one another. So. Check yourself on that this week. How do I think about people in my life? Are they, are they good, godly thoughts? Are you having good and godly thoughts about people? Are you picking them apart? Somebody said the thought is the father of the deed. Proverbs 23, 7 in the New King James Version says that a person is how he thinks in his heart. If we have critical and judgmental thoughts concerning one another, we can be sure that the love of God will not be manifesting itself through our lives. 
Can I just share it this way? Loving actions start by loving attitudes. If we're ever going to have good and loving actions towards one another, it has to start with some better attitudes. Now, you don't have to raise your hand or act like you need it, but is there anybody here that needs an attitude adjustment towards some people in your life that love the Lord? You love the Lord, they love the Lord, but your attitude towards them is not right. Take it to the Lord. Another way in which we can demonstrate our love is by how we speak about and to one another. So when, so when you're with people you like to be with, and you're talking about folks, how are you talking about people? How do you spend your time talking about people? Are you talking about them in an encouraging, loving way? Or are you running them down? Are you tearing them down? How are you doing with that? Do you let your ears be garbage cans? So people can fill you with all kinds of crud about it, other people? Or are you the kind of person that, you know, the truth is, if we say it or if we listen to it, we're just as guilty. Sometimes we have to lovingly find a way to say, Well, life would be horrible if we couldn't talk about people. I don't disagree with that. I love talking about people, but God help us to talk about people in an appropriate way. Amen. Let us find good. Now, it's just us here today, and I'm not going to single you out. But I wonder how many people here need to take this to heart and say, you know, I need to think about people and talk about people better. Words are powerful things. They can encourage or discourage. If you, if you become somebody who has an encouraging word and find good even in difficult situations in people, but you find good in them, if you're an encourager, people will beat a path to your door. Everyone likes an encourager. I, I didn't say to patronize, but no one likes a cynical, sharp-tongued backbiter. We can demonstrate love through encouragement. Thirdly, we can show our love by how we act toward one another. We must not love in word only, but also in deed. Boy, it's got quiet in here. Have you noticed how quiet it is? I think the Lord's working on us. I'm preaching this thing, and I'm, I got work to do. I got a couple of people I got to call this week. I got one person I got to tell and say, I, I let people talk about you in a negative way, and I sit there and took it in, and I needed to stop. Sometimes you get comfortable with the close friends, the people that you, you're chummy with, and so all of a sudden, if you're not careful, you start doing things that you shouldn't because, well, we're close. We, we can talk. We can, we, can, you know, we can rip that person to shreds because we're good buddies. Can't even get one amen in him. <laughs> Somebody else want to come up here and finish this message? I need to go to the altar. Right? Right? We must not love in word only, but indeed, love is not a feeling, it's an action of the will. To give our enemies a cup of cold water is to show love. Love is something we do. How can you show love to someone this week by an act of your will? W would somebody in here take some time and show some love to somebody? 
Some of you in, in your Christian family I'm talking about. Some of you need to experience a release of frustration even if you're right and the other person is wrong. Show love to them and see what God does. Invite someone you do not know well or someone you think you don't like very much. Invite them over for lunch or out for dinner. Get to know them. Call them. Take the time. Invest the energy. It'll be worth it. Our love has to reach in. The second point is going to be real short. Our love must reach out. Remember, Jesus said we testify to the world that we are really his disciples by how we love one another. Love testifies. Love liberates. When the world sees our love, they become more receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our, our love must not only reach into one another, our love then, out of reaching into one another, then our love can truly begin to reach out to those outside the church who don't know Christ. I love our Calvary motto and vision statement, loving people to life, because it really gives us marching orders in all that we are and all that we do. Because people are so important to God, they should be important to us. Could, could you say amen if you agree with that? Because people are so important to God, they should be important to us. I was lost and without Jesus along with my family. Do you guys realize you're looking at a guy up here that at one time, my dad and mom, my three sisters and I were totally lost without Jesus, were messed up, had nothing at one point, everything was taken away because dad couldn't make the payments anymore, the job was stripped away because of tax problems and sin and alcohol and life came crashing down and our life was an absolute disaster and I was a little boy that was a nervous wreck and scared of my dad. Our family was a mess. And somebody that knew how to love the family of God, out of that love for God that they had developed, they came and reached out to the Bowman family, somebody they didn't know, and they told my dad about the love of Jesus and said, Clayton, I'm not here to play religious games with you. I'm here to tell you that Jesus can change everything in your life. And my dad didn't believe it at first, but it sowed a seed into his heart. My dad was mean to the guy. He said, I'm Catholic, you're not, you're nuts. I'm squared away, don't talk to me, that's personal. My faith is personal. If you talk to me again, I'll hit you in the nose. And the guy came back. Jack Hendrickson had the nerve to come back and bring a sack of groceries and love us at our level. Jesus gave us our mission statement. It's found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. In a word, our mission statement is go and make disciples. And listen to what we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We are Christ representatives. God, help us here today to be the representatives of Christ, to be lovers of God and lovers of people. God, help us to love people like Jesus loved us. Lord, change our hearts. Renew us to a profound love for the people in this earth. Somebody observed that Christians are like the Arctic River, frozen over at the mouth. The greatest tragedy of all would be to have the truth that sets people free and never share that truth. So let me close this morning. How can we be bold enough to share this message? Only if we have a heart for others to 
come to Jesus. This is why many of you are willing to reach out to people and show them the way. The other day I was asked by somebody how to get to a restaurant. And I was trying to explain to them how to get to the restaurant and there was between here where I was and the restaurant there was two detours, there was road construction, it was a mess and I'm trying to tell them when and they didn't have a clue. And I couldn't figure out how to tell them and finally I said, just follow me. And I got in my car and I took them to the restroom. And the Lord said, that's what I want you to do with people that need me. Don't, don't point them and say, go down here and turn left and turn right. Bring them to me. I know you don't have time, you're too busy, but stop once in a while when the Lord gives you an opportunity and lead somebody to the love of Jesus. I learned a little song many years ago and I pulled it on Pastor Rod. Are you smiling back there? Um, I didn't pull it on Mariah, I pulled it on Pastor Rod. Pastor Rod can go with me, Mariah would have killed me. In love. <clears throat> I learned this little song. All right, I gotta give you a forewarning here. Bill Gaither wrote this song, so, uh, no, what, what? <laughs> let it go, let it go. But I just, I just had to sing it before we, Pastor Rod comes, and I got to be quick. We're going to have an announcement, receive our morning tithes and offerings. But this little song goes like this. Loving God, loving each other, making My friends, loving God, loving each other, and the story never ends. Jesus was talking to his disciples in the upper room, and he said, the setting was, was like this. They push back, they push back from the table to listen to his words, his secret plans before he had to go. It's not complicated. Don't need a lot of rules. This is all you really need to know. Loving God, loving each other. My friends, loving God, loving each other, and the story never ends. One more verse. We tend to make harder, build steeples out of stone, 
fill books with explanations of the way. But if we stop and listen and break a little bread, we would hear, hear the master say, come on, will you stand up? Maybe join somebody's hand this morning. It's loving God, loving each other. How about stretch across the aisle even? Making music with my friends. Loving God, loving each other. Amen. God bless you. Give the Lord praise. Amen. Pastor.